<laughs> All right, Jeremiah chapter 5, and uh, let's look at verse number 31, the last verse there. This is the first uh, phrase. It says, the prophets prophesy falsely. That's the title for the sermon this morning. The prophets prophesy falsely. You know, my, my greatest fear, brethren, my greatest fear as a pastor is to come behind this pulpit and say something false. That's my greatest fear. Have I said false things? Probably. Why? Because I'm a human being, right? Probably have said some wrong things behind the pulpit, but you know, every time I get up, I just have a fear of God. I, I, the last thing I want to do is let down God and let down God's people. You know, people come to, I, I think about the idea, you know, of starting churches and, and people come to church and they want to be fed the word of God and it just dawns on me how serious this business is, you know, of preaching God's word. And what we notice here in this time of, of Judah is that they had prophets, they had preachers. Don't forget that a, that a prophet is just another way of saying preacher, okay? It's not always somebody that's telling the future, okay? It's just someone preaching God's word. And they were preaching falsely, and so this, this nation was in a uh, disastrous place. You know, God's judgment was falling upon them. Not even the preachers, not even the pastors behind the pulpit were preaching true things. They were preaching falsely. And this is why, you know... Um, you know, coming down here for the 12 months, this is why I wanted to be here and, and have some training sessions on how to study the Bible, how to preach, be careful what you say, be careful about what is clearly written in the Bible, be careful about what, you know, clearly indicating what is your personal opinion, your personal belief, you know, separating these two things because we don't want to become prophets that prophesy falsely. You know, we start prophesying falsely, our church will fall apart. Okay, just like this nation of Judah started to fall apart. So let's start there in verse number one. Jeremiah chapter five and verse number one. God tells Jeremiah, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If ye can find a man, if there be any that execute of judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. God is telling Jeremiah, look, go for the whole capital city of, of Jerusalem and, and see if you can just find one person, one person that fears God, one person that executes judgment, somebody that truly knows the difference between right and wrong. You know, somebody that's seeking the truth. If you just find one man, Jeremiah, in Jerusalem, I will forgive you guys. I will pardon it. I will not allow the Babylonians to come and take you guys into captivity. Now, we know that they were still taken into captivity. So do you think Jeremiah found a man? Not at all. He didn't find a man. Can you please keep your finger there? And let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you've got uh, Jeremiah, then Lamentations, then Ezekiel, okay? You're in Jeremiah, then Lamentations, then Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel 22, verse 28. Ezekiel 22 and verse number 28. By the way, Jeremiah was not from Jerusalem, okay? And so we can't say, well, hold on, that was Jeremiah. No, Jeremiah was preaching in Jerusalem, but he was not of Jerusalem. This is why he couldn't even find a man in, in the whole city. You know, that would uh, fear God. And so the city was obviously full of unbelievers, you know. And he, you could even say that the city had believers. I'm sure there were believers in Jerusalem. There were saved people, but they were lame. Okay? And what I personally find, you know, the reason I decided to join an IFB church, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, when I was like 20 years old or whatever I was, I, 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 I found these churches, I found these preachers to be preachers that wanted the truth proclaimed. You know, it, it didn't matter what was, you know, what was popular or not. You know, they had a heart to reach souls. They, they had a heart for the King James Bible. And that's what drew me to the independent fundamental Baptists. But what I'm finding over the last few decades is they are slowly scaling away from the soul wind. They're slowly scaling away from a strong position on the King James Bible. They're slowly uh, you know, uh, moving away from, from clear biblical teachings and they're just giving good, good, you know, few good sermons that people could find in your average Hillsong church. And, you know, and my concern is that we might be entering a, a phase where even the churches that we once thought were great churches are scaling back. You know, they're no, no longer preaching the truth. They're no longer executing judgment the way God desires. And so when we look at Ezekiel 22 and verse number 28, Ezekiel 22 and verse number 28, who was Ezekiel? Ezekiel was one of the priests. And uh, in Judah, and he was taken, if you start by reading Ezekiel chapter 1, you notice he's already a captive. He's, he's already been taken into captivity by the Babylonians, okay? And he's a priest that God used. But look at Ezekiel 22 verse 28. It says here, And her prophets, again, we're looking at the prophets that prophesy falsely. These are the prophets of Judah. Have daubed them with untempted mortar, seen vanity, 
and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. And brethren, you know, Sydney is full of preachers. There are churches right now, people meeting in churches right now, where the preachers are saying things, well, God feels this way, God sees it this way, and they are speaking words that God did not speak. We have to be careful as preachers. You ever get behind this pulpit, please understand I have a high expectation from you. I expect you to fear God. I expect you to be careful about what you're going to say. And I'm only going to say what God clearly says. Amen. Otherwise, you'll be like this. When the Lord has not spoken, you're saying things that the Lord has not spoken. Be very careful. Be very careful. Any of us can fall into this trap. Right? Let's keep going. Verse number 29. The people of that land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Now look at verse number 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. So you can see the consistency, right? He's telling Jeremiah, go find one man. And then Ezekiel's taken into captivity and God's telling Ezekiel, I couldn't find a man. All right? There was not one that would stand in the gap. Verse number 31. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. What do we learn from this? You know, Brother Matthew preached a great sermon not long ago. Was it last week, brother? I'm losing track of time. You know, about how God can, you know, he was saying, hey, you know, we might be a small church, but God can use and God has used this church in a great way. You know, God has already seen many souls saved by the work of this church. And so, yes, we can look at a church, but you know what? God is just looking for a man. God is just looking for one person that will stand up and not be afraid, not be, you know, afraid. Well, what happens if I say the truth? You know, will people come and, and, and uh, you know, will I be in the media? Will people come and sue me? Will people come and arrest me? And, and if you're afraid, you're not that man. You've got to live up and be that man. You've got to be someone who is fearless, who's willing to preach God's word without compromise. That's who God is looking for. And, and you know, you say, well, you know, I've got some fear about what the Bible says. Well, you know what? Start working. Start walking closely with God. Start reading your Bible. Start getting passionate about the things that God gets passionate about. Start hating the things that God hates. Start loving the things that God loves. You know, get into God's Word and, and let the brainwashing of this world die away and start understanding how God sees this world and sees this nation. I don't know what God necessarily thinks of Australia, but I don't think He's thinking wonderful things about Australia. I don't think He's thinking wonderful things about Sydney. You know, as, as we go about and... and what even, even the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, the uh, homosexual Mardi Gras, all right? I mean, we'll, who was it that message? Someone saying, hey, you know, it's, it's not on this next year because of COVID-19. Woo, it's not on! But then they still found a way to put him into a stadium or something. They still find a way. This is so important for our city to celebrate. They still found a way to celebrate it even though it's with lesser numbers. You know, it's disgusting. There are so many other serious matters in this city, in this nation, and these are the things that our politicians are prioritizing. Well, again, you know, it's Jeremiah's days are like this, right? We need men, and, and men, I truly say, you know, the Lord needs you. The Lord needs you to stand up, to be, to be a gap in your family, to, to, to stand in the gap of your family, to stand in the gap of this church, stand in the gap of this city and of this nation. We need more men. I, my heart is to plant more churches. My heart is to one day plant a church in Brisbane and maybe Melbourne and maybe Auckland. Okay? If we train up men, I don't care how long it takes. I'm still young. I'm still, well, I'm 39. Hey, you know, I'll keep preaching until the day I die. And if we can start many churches, many soul winning churches, people that are preaching God's truth in this area, in this area of the world, then praise God. But you know, God is looking for a man. I want you to be that man. I want you to be that person. You don't have to be the pastor, but just being a faithful member of the church, just a good support to the leader that's running that, that's, uh, of the leader of that church. You know, that's what God is looking for. And we can change. We can change things. We don't have to let a, a, a Sydney be into captivity. We don't need to let Sydney be defiled with all this corruption. We can try to slow it down. We can still uh, win souls and pull them out of the fire. Bring them into everlasting life to be with us forever in heaven. Back to Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 2. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 2. And though they say, the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. So yeah, you know what? Again, uh, our city, Jerusalem, you know, there are a lot of people speaking about God. 
All right, well, you know, as I get electricians to come in and, and fix things up for the lighting or, or do different, uh, you know, signage on the windows, people are like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but you're not saved. <laughs> right? That they say, well, the Lord liveth, they say. Right? Surely they swear falsely. Okay? And, and, you know, I don't want to have this idea that just because someone identifies as a follower of Jesus or as a Christian, that they're automatically saved. There are many people that swear falsely, that swear falsely to Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower or something, but they're not even saved. They don't even know that salvation is a free gift paid completely in Jesus Christ. That it's not of your works, it's not of your good deeds. It's only of your faith and what Christ has done for us that gets us to heaven. There's so many people that swear falsely, that claim to be Christ, or uh, sorry, Christ followers, or, you know, saved people, but they're not. All right? Let's keep going. Verse number three. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, and they, and they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Look, he's saying, this is not the first time. The Babylonians is not the first chastisement or, or fall of judgment that's coming upon Judah. God has chastised them before. God has brought correction upon them before. But he's saying they've not learnt their lesson. They've just hardened their faces. It's like a child being disciplined, right? And instead of that child, you know, uh, you know uh, saying, being sorry for the wrong that they've done, they harden their faces, I'm going to take this punishment. It's like, ah, oh, you know, it's rebellion against chastisement. It's rebellion against authority. And they're saying, look, you've, you're, doing, you're acting like a child. You're hardening your face against God. You know, and, and brethren, let me tell you this. You know, God chastises all of us. He chastises all of us. And when you feel God's chastisement, if you're going through some trial or difficulty, first thing to think about, is there something God is correcting me on? Is there something God trying to bring my attention to? And if you find there's an area in your life that needs to be fixed, go and fix it. Because the chastisement's not going to go away if you just harden your face and think you're fine with God. You know, if you don't uh, correct the, the error, God's going to bring stronger correction stronger hand of judgment and you're going to have more difficulties in life and then you might be like well you know i'll just you know i'm fine i'm all good you know you let your pride speak for you then god brings a harder judgment a harder correction and before you know it he might even take your life away from you because you've hardened your face against the lord hey even christians can do this if you're going through some trial don't automatically think oh it's the devil don't automatically think you know it's persecution it just might be God allowing you to go through some difficulty to fix something in you. Maybe you've not been walking with God and God just wants you to come back to Him. And so in, the, in your state of difficulty, you're calling out to God, God help me. Maybe that's why. Okay? But you fix the problem. Otherwise, the chastisement, the trial difficulty won't go away. It'll just become harder. It'll just become more difficult for you to get through. Verse number three. Sorry, verse number four. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish. For they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. So Jeremiah is saying, oh man, these, you know, my people here on this land, they must be just stupid. They don't know the judgment. They don't know when God has judged them, right? He's saying that they must be so ignorant, they don't even know God's methods anymore. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number four. Therefore I said, so Jeremiah comes to a realization here. He says, therefore I said, surely these are, sorry, verse number five. He says, I will get me unto the great men. He says, look, Man, they're just, they're just lacking knowledge. They don't realize God's hand of chastisement. His correction is falling upon them. His judgment. Therefore, I'm going to go to the great men. I'm going to go to potentially the politicians or, or the religious leaders. I'll go talk to them. Okay? I'll go talk to the great men and will speak unto them. For they have known the way of the Lord. They know the ways of the Lord. Right? And the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. So when he goes to, to, to speak to these leaders, maybe politicians, maybe religious leaders, he finds out that even they are rebellious against God. Even they can't help the nation, right? It says they've broken the, 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 broken the yoke and burst of bonds. You know, it, it's like, you know, instead of following God's commandments, they're like, oh, we don't need that. They break away from God's law, break away from the commandments of God. And no wonder this nation is going so bad. The people are wicked, but the leaders are wicked. All right? And it seems like Joe Biden has been elected as the president of the United States. You know why that nation has a wicked president? Because it's a wicked nation. They're just getting what they deserve. 
And when we get a wicked nation, a, a wicked government, and a weak, wicked politicians, it's because our nation has become wicked. Sure. Okay? You, you, think, you think the leaders, the great men, are going to fix things? They're not. Okay? They just do whatever the people want to be in power. That's it. Okay? The people that can change the nation are God's people. Okay? With the gospel, with the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed upon them. Verse number 6. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them. Now we're going to be looking at the lion, the wolf, and the leopard here. Speaking about, again, it's speaking about the Babylonians coming to take them, okay, coming to uh, defeat them. So it says here, that wherefore a lion. So uh, the Babylonians have been described as a lion, as a wolf, and a, a leopard here. So wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them. So it's saying, look, you're going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. Just like a lion will slay its prey. And then it says here, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil them. So a wolf of the evenings, you know, a wolf will um, sometimes hunt in the dark. Okay, so it's kind of saying like, you know, it's going to be an unexpected. You're not going to be, ex be ex uh, expecting to lose this battle. You're not expecting them to come and wipe you guys out. Okay, so it's, it's been done in the evening as it were, right, Sy symbolically. And then it says, a leopard shall watch over the cities. So it's saying, look, they're going to send spies. They're intelligent. They're tactful. They know how you fight. They know how you're going to react. They're ready for you. They're ready to fight. It says, Everyone that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many and their backslidings are increased. And so they're definitely going to be defeated. You've got these three animals being described as different ways they hunt and watch their enemies. Verse number 7. How shall I pardon, these for, the, pardon thee for this? Look, God's saying, how can I forgive you? How, how, can I be, how can I forgive you for your wickedness, for your backslidings? It says, thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. Listen, you, you, you worship gods that are no gods. How can I forgive you? God is saying, right? When I have fed them to the full, he says, look, I've been good to you. I've fed you. I've given everything you need, right? Then, uh, they then committed, committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. Now, this is speaking, again, of spiritual adultery, right? They've gone to these other uh, gods instead of the one true God. And, and God's using this very, uh, again, very uh, crude language. It's like a, a bunch of soldiers being gathered around a prostitute's house. Just one after another. That's, that's what you want. That's all you're after. You know, just, you're just going after these strange gods, these false gods. You're acting like adulterers. Okay, so God speaks in verse number 7 about a spiritual adultery, that they've turned away from God. But then when we look at verse number 8, he's speaking not just spiritually, but physically as well. That the nation had become an adulterous, wicked uh, nation. Verse number 8, it says, They were as fed horses in the morning, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. It says, look, you don't even, you don't even care about marriage. You, you don't even care about adultery. You're just taking that man's wife. You're taking that man's wife. There's just sexual you know, immorality. There's fornication. There's adultery. There's wickedness in this city. But I want you to understand the downfall. It, it didn't start that way. First, it was a spiritual adultery. First, it was their turning against God. And because they've turned against God, it then caused them to commit you know, adultery, physical adultery with their neighbor's wives. And they're being described like horses, just like animals. You're animals, God is telling them. And brethren, this is what we learn. We, what we learn here is, you know, in order for you to keep yourself pure, to keep yourself, you know, pure to your wedding day, right? If you've not made that mistake yet, the, the way to uh, not commit adultery, to, to remain faithful to your spouse and not uh, commit these wicked acts, what you must do is stay close to God. Okay, those that commit such acts, the reason they've done it is because they first moved away from God. They first turned away from God and because they were far from God spiritually, then you can get into all manners of sexual sins. Okay, in order for you to remain pure in this part of your life, you must remain walking with God, close to God. Okay, and that'll stop that downward spiral. But I want you to understand how they got into this state. Let's look at verse number six, uh, sorry, verse number seven once again. I kind of mentioned it. It says, when I had fed them to the full, okay? And then verse number eight says, they were as fed horses, okay? So we learn, we get a theme there, okay? So saying the people of Judah were well fed, okay? They had everything they needed, okay? They were blessed by God. They were blessed on the land. They were rich. 
Okay? They could enjoy their possessions and their wealth. They, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were blossoming. Like economically, people were doing well. All right? And again, I just think of Australia. One of the richest nations, you know, per person in this world. You know, the highest minimum wage in this country. I don't understand when people tell me it's so hard in Australia. It's like, man, maybe you just need to live somewhere else in this world for a little while and come back and appreciate, you know, the blessings that you do have on this land. Okay, but the danger, the danger of being fed, the danger of always being full, the danger of, of being too blessed, brethren, is that you get to a point where you think, I don't no longer need God. You have too much. You know, you don't know what to do with your wealth. You don't know what to do with yourself. You have too much idle time because you don't need to work as much. And then you get into wickedness, wickedness. And what we see in our nation, brethren, is that, yes, it's, it's a great country. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm thankful that my parents migrated here. It's given me opportunities. It's given, you know, my, our family opportunities. But when you're too full, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. All right? And, and when you have too much, you've got to ask yourself the question, why do I have so much, God? What do you want me to do with what I have? Is it just to indulge? Because if you start indulging in yourself, brethren, it's just going to lead you into wickedness. Okay? We'll look at that soon. Why does God give us uh, wealth? We'll have a look at that soon. Verse number 9. Shall I not visit for these things? God's asking the question, isn't it obvious that I've got to come and bring judgment on these guys? <laughs> Save the Lord. And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go ye up upon her walls and destroy it. Now God's actually, at, here, verse number 10 and 11, God is speaking to the Babylonians prophetically through Jeremiah. Okay, so he's telling the Babylonians, go ye upon her walls, that's the walls of Jerusalem, and destroy but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt tr very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. So God's telling Babylon's, go and attack them. Go and destroy them. But he says, but don't make them a full end. Don't destroy them completely. Okay? Don't forget that Judah would, once they're taken into captivity, uh, be there for 70 years, and then they will be brought back into the land. They weren't made a full end, okay? They were still, God still had a plan for them to come back and rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, all those things. Now, please keep your finger there. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Keep your finger there. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. What I'm about to teach you guys is very important, very important. If there's only one thing you remember in this sermon, I want you to remember this one, okay? Back in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 10, it said, when it's speaking about Babylonians, the Babylonians, it says, Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. You know, what are the battlements? The, the fortified cities, you know, their, 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 their strength. He goes, you know, go, go and, and destroy their forts, go and destroy their barracks, go and destroy their, their military, the military might of Judah. Go and destroy those, those, uh, you know, those, those forces of, of, uh, of war. Okay? And then it says, they are not the Lord's. They are not the Lord's. Okay? What is that teaching us? That's teaching that not every battle is the Lord's. You got Judah, they're ready for warfare. They're ready to fight the Babylonians. Remember, they're God's people, they are. They are God's people. They're under the covenant with God. All right, and they've got their, their battlements, they've got their horses, they've got their chariots, and they've got their soldiers, and God says, those are not mine. They don't belong to me. One thing you must understand in the Christian life is that not every battle is the Lord's. Not every battle is the Lord's. Okay? Listen, COVID-19 restriction is not a battle of the Lord. It's not a battle of the Lord. You don't have to get involved in this battle Okay? Because you're going to get wiped out. You're going to lose. God did not call you to fight the battle of COVID-19. Okay? COVID-19 restrictions. Show me in the Bible where God tells us to fight that. You're in Ephesians chapter 6, chapter, uh, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Does God want us fighting? Absolutely. We're in the Lord's army. Verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, okay? But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, brethren, our battle is spiritual. We're fighting for the souls of men. 
I don't care if you win the battle of whether you wear a mask or not. I, I would just, I don't, listen, if I knock on someone's door and I have to wear a mask and I get that person saved, I don't care about the mask. Amen. That's not the battle I'm fighting, brethren. It, do you find that annoying? Absolutely. I've never even had to wear a mask once, in fact. <laughs> okay? Thank God for Queensland. Thank God. I feel, man, I don't know what I'd be doing if I was in, in Victoria. I'd be really annoyed. I'd be tempted to go and fight those battles. I'd be tempted to join those protests. I'd be tempted to do those things. And then I have to ask myself the question, is this God's fight? Is this what God has called me to fight? Am I going to waste my time hours and hours protesting, maybe getting arrested, right? For what cause? For what cause? Am I, am I wrestling against flesh and blood? You know, is this what we're called to fight, brethren? Understand, what I'm, what I'm telling you, brethren, is this. Our battle is primarily spiritual, okay? The devil is at play. Is the devil behind all these restrictions and moving toward a, you know, removing our rights? Absolutely he is. Absolutely he's behind. All Listen, we, we already know this from the beginning. You know, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Thessalonians said that the mystery of iniquity doth already work to bring in the Antichrist. Back 2,000 years ago, it was already at work. It's not, like, it's not like, oh man, you know, Satan's at work now. He's always been at work. This should be no surprise to us. It's not like, oh, you're so ignorant, Pastor Kevin. Don't you realize what's going on? Yep, we've known that. Haven't you read your Bible? It's been from the beginning. Okay, the devil's working hard to bring in his power and his government, but we've not been called to fight those wars, brethren. In fact, you read Revelation. When the beast makes war against the believers... It says he overpowers them. Okay? It says he beats them. He defeats them. The tribulation is not a time where, where Christians have victory on this earth, but it's a time where Christians will gain lots of rewards in heaven because they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. Okay? You read it. Read the end times. Do you ever see Christians standing up against the Antichrist, making war against the Antichrist? They're losing the war against the Antichrist. Okay? But they're winning the war of souls. They're winning the war of the Great Commission. That's what they're doing. All right? Keep your mind. Think about this. I really want you to focus on this. Okay? And I don't just mean COVID-19. I'm just saying every battle you might find yourself in. Anytime you're tempted to fight something, stop. Ask yourself the question, is this God's battle? Is this the fight that God wants me to fight? You know? Look in His Word. Can you get confirmation from His Word that this is the battle you're to fight? So, but we've got, you know, we've got the battlements. We've, we've got the fortified cities. We've got the chariots. We've got the horses. What do we have to lose? Everything. If it's Babylon, if it's Babylon, okay, everything. If it's Babylon, you're going to get wiped out. If it's God's judgment on this nation, you're actually fighting against God's judgment. God might be using Babylonians. Hey, the Babylonians were not righteous people. They were wicked people. They had their false gods too. They worshipped Satan too. But God allowed them to be used to bring judgment upon that city, upon those people. Okay? God may very well allow the forces of, of Satan to march a little bit forward and bring some judgment upon Australia. Because we deserve it, brethren. We deserve it. With all the abortions, with the same-sex marriage, okay? With, with the euthanasia laws and, and everything, all the wickedness that's coming into this nation... You know, every time we, we see difficulties and bushfires and all that, I'm just praying, God, can you just bring a fear of God into this land? I'm not asking God, can you put, off the, put out the fires? I'm not asking that anymore. I'm not asking that anymore. I'm asking God, can you use this in a powerful way that people will be afraid about losing their lives? That they will seek you, Lord, that they will seek the answers for uh, you know, everlasting life. And can you please send a, a soul winner to their door to tell them the truth? That's what I'm praying these days. Back to Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 12. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not He. Neither shall evil come upon us. Neither shall we see sword or famine. Nor famine. That's what they're saying in the land. Yeah, it's all going to be good. God's not going to judge us. Peace and safety. Right? It does remind me of the end times. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But then it says this about us. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Brethren, we don't need to be in darkness. Just recognize God's judgment. Just recognize that as our nation gets more and more wicked, I'm not happy about it. I don't, I don't rejoice in the wickedness. 
And you know what? It's not like I delight. It's not like I'm like, all right, God, judge this nation. You know, destroy these people. That's not what I want. I'm like, God, can you give us a little bit more time? Help us win a few more souls before your judgment falls. That's what I'm asking for. But please use the difficulties in this world that people may have a fear of you. Verse number 14. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, that's the peace and safety, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth. Sorry, I, I missed verse number 13. Let me just read that again. Verse number 13. This is important. It says, and the prophets, this is the prophets of the land, shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. The reason they're going to get it destroyed is because the prophets, the preachers, the pastors, they become like wind. It says, and the word is not in them. They're not preaching God's word. They get behind the pulpit, start with jokes, start with some story. I've been there. I've been sitting in the pulpit, in the, in the, in the pews, waiting to get a good Bible study. What does God's word say? It's like the introduction's half an hour long. And it's like, all right, brethren, you know, I'm, I'm wrapping things up now. I'm like, man, are we going to even open our Bibles? You open one Bible verse. And then it's just, it's, it's like, what in the world? The whole, the whole hour of sitting there listening to this guy was just wind. Yeah. And it's just hot air. It just blows away. It has no substance. Yeah. We, gotta, I, I, we can, I, I don't want a preacher behind this pulpit being hot air. No, the word of God not in them. What? That's not the preacher we want in this pulpit. Those are not the men we need here. Right? Blessed are Baptist Church, brethren. I love this church. And I want this to be a church that proclaims God's word. God's word. We don't want to be preachers of wind. Amen. You, you think people come to this church just to be... Ah, <sighs> oh, thanks, Pastor Kevin. What a great sermon. <laughs> Look at verse number 14. This is what the preacher should be like. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, he's speaking to Jeremiah, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, Amen. and this people would, and it shall devour them. Amen. You know, when you, this is when you know you've heard a preacher, when you feel like you've been burnt. <laughs> That's when, right? when, when the preaching is like fire, and it kind of hurts, and it's uncomfortable, it burns. Yeah, that's the church you want to be, that's the church you should be part of, brethren. That's the church you should be part of. You know, and so, sometimes if you get burnt, I might blow a little bit and help it soothe it a little bit, right? <laughs> okay. But the whole sermon ought not to be wind, right? It needs to be fire. It needs to burn. It needs to consume, all right? It needs to consume sin. It needs to consume wickedness. It needs to consume wrong understanding and wrong beliefs. God's preachers need to be different from the preachers of this world. Verse number 15. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. Again, the Babylonians. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is an open sepulcher. They are all mighty men. Their quiver. What's a quiver? Anyone know what a quiver is? Maybe, but... Yeah, it's more for arrows. It's more an arrows. So, so look, their, 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 their pouch for their arrows, what does it say there? It's an open sepulchre. It's, a sepulchre is a grave. It's like sepulveda. That's where it comes from. That's her name. <laughs> Past the grave. <laughs> Past the death. <laughs> it's an open sepulchre. He says, look, you know, they're going to destroy you guys. I mean, they're so strong. They're so mighty. You go and fight them. You're going to die. Okay? You're going you're going to the grave. If you fight these guys, right? They're all mighty men. They're all powerful, trained warriors. They know how to fight. Verse number 17. And they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thine herds. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. They shall impoverish, uh, impoverish their fenced cities, wherein thou trustest with the sword. So the Babylonians are going to come in. Uh, not just defeat them militarily, but it's going to take all their possessions, all their food, all the things they had planned to give into inheritance for their children. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to be consumed by the Babylonians. Verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. Once again, he's promising you're going to come back one day. Okay. Verse number 19. And it shall come to pass when you shall say, Wherefore doeth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then shall thou answer them, Like as ye have forsaken me, 
and serve strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. So when people start asking, God, why did you allow this to happen? Doesn't that happen? You go door knocking. Well, if God truly exists, why does he allow people to die from hunger? Right? Why does he allow uh, these natural disasters? Why, why, why? Well, this is why. Okay? Because you've turned your backs against the Lord. That's why. You've gone and you served strange gods. So what God is saying is, you've turned against me, I'm turning against you. You want to strange, serve strange gods? Well, go, go and serve the strangers. Go serve some other people then, if that's what you want. So they're just getting the full end. They're just, getting, they're just receiving what they wanted in the first place. Okay? People say, why does God allow this? Uh, you know, I don't really say at the door, because you, you're wicked, that's why. <laughs> well, we kind of do, don't we? Because we say, we tell them they're sinners. We tell them, hey, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in a way, we are telling them. I guess we're not doing it exactly how Jeremiah did it, but we're doing it. We're doing it. <laughs> Verse number 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob and pl publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. So God is telling the people, you have eyes, but you, don't, you, don't, you can't see properly. You have ears, you can't hear properly. Okay. Now, why is he saying this about the people of Judah? Well, keep your finger there. Let's go to Psalm 115, please. Psalm 115. Psalm 115. God tells us how a people can become blind or deaf, spiritually. Okay? In Psalm 115, verse number 4, it says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So when you start worshipping statues, idols, the Catholic Church, <clears throat> right? Buddhists with their Buddha images. Who else has images and pictures? Hindus. Hindus. Okay, if you make those your gods, right, what, what happens? Verse number five, they have mouths, but they speak not. Ears, eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. So obviously that's very obvious about a statue, okay? They can't do any of those things. But look at verse number eight. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. So if, if you worship an idol that cannot see, then God's going to make you blind, spiritually. An idol that can't hear, God's going to make you unable to hear. You worship false gods that can't walk, you're not going to be able to walk the ways of God. Okay? So the people that worship these false gods become like unto those idols. Okay? Spiritually dead, as it were. Okay? So that's why Judah has become in this state. They've started to worship these false gods. Now, back to Jeremiah 5, verse number 22. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. What does it mean to fear God? Is it just a, just a just, you know, God just, when it says to fear God, it's just, just respect God. Respect his authority. Is that what it means to fear God? No, it doesn't. Fear means to fear. To have, I told you, when I get behind this pulpit, I'm afraid. Okay? My heart starts pumping. Because I want to preach God's word to God's people. I know how much God loves you. You know, I think about the people in this church and I immediately think, these are God's children. This is God's family. God loves you guys. He saved you with his son, right? God wants you to be more like Jesus every day. He loves you. He protects you. He's going to protect you from false teaching. Okay? And I just think, man, these people are the most important people in Sydney. The most important people here in Fairfield East right now is these people right here. God's people. And God, you want me to come behind the pulpit and speak to them God's word? Right? Fear. Fear. I'm afraid to let you down. I'm afraid to let down God. Look at this. What kind of fear? Fear you not me, saith Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence? To shake and tremble. Listen, when the Israelites saw God's presence on the mountain, the lightnings and the thunderings, they were so afraid. And they went to Moses and said, Moses, don't let God talk to us. You talk to us, Moses. Look, it's good to be afraid of God. It's good to fear God. It will help you walk in His ways. I don't want God's chastisement. I'd rather just please God. I know I get His chastisement sometimes because I'm not perfect, but I'd rather just... I want to make sure God is always pleased. I don't want Him to be angry at me. 
Right? So, you know, healthy fear is right. Your children should have a healthy fear of being corrected when they disobey mum and dad. Okay? It will help them on the right paths. Tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bounds of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it. And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people have a revolting and a rebellious heart. They have revolted and gone. Neither say they in, in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. They don't say that. They don't say let us fear God. Okay? That giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. And so brethren, Australia needs the fear of God to return. Australia needs the fear of God to return. But not just Australia. You, you need the fear of God in your lives if you haven't got it. You need it. Okay? As God's people, God can bring swift judgment upon you as well. I'll just read to you Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing, brethren. Hey, the context of this passage is about believers. The context of this passage is about God's chastisement, God's judgment upon His people, upon the saved. You know, even the saved should have a fear of God. Unbelievers should have a fear of God. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. When I was soul winning with brother David, not long ago, there was a guy at the door, remember he said, he goes, what, I, I, do you fear hell or something like that? You, is, does that bring fear? It should bring fear. It should bring fear. It's almost like he was trying to mock the idea that you should fear hell. You should fear hell. God's word says fear hell, where God can cast both body and soul in hell. Okay? It ought to be that fear, and you know, what is hell? Burning for all eternity in the flames of hell. Having rejected Jesus Christ, knowing that you'll never get out of that place. Facing God's wrath and God's fire for rejecting His free gift and His Son. It ought to give people fear. And once people have that fear, they're like, save me! How do I get out of this place? And that's where the beautiful gospel comes in. The free gift of salvation. Verse number 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things. That's uh, turned away the, the blessings of God. Your sins have turned away the blessings of God. And your sins have withholden good things from you. So brethren, your sins, when you're tempted to sin, I want you to think about this. Quite often when we sin, or tempted to sin, we think, oh, if I sin, God will judge me somehow. Okay? I, I, I'm disappointing God. Yes, but it's not just that. When you sin, you have good that God wanted to do unto you. You have blessings that God wanted to give you, taken away from you, removed from you. Okay, so it's not just the punishment, it's also the removal of good things that God would have given you. Next time you're facing some type of temptation, you know, don't let it be, well, I'm going to disappoint God. That's one thing that should be keeping you from sinning. But the other thing is, well, I want to make sure I hold on to God's blessings in my life. You know, those two elements will help you overcome sin when you think about those things. Verse number 26, For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait, and he that set up snares... That's like traps. They sell, oh, there it is. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. Do you know how someone becomes great and rich and powerful in this world? Wicked men. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Okay. Pretty much it's going to be wicked men that seem like successful people in this world. Rich people, okay, with their, with their mansions and their billions of dollars and all their power and all their influence. You know, they got that way because they were wicked, okay? Let's keep going. Verse number 28. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? And so, brethren, what this is telling us is that ungodly, wicked people with too much money, they don't know what to do with it. When they're a poor and needy, they don't give to the poor and needy. When, when, you know, this is why God gives you wealth above what you have. So you can be a blessing to others. So you can be generous to others. 
That's why God gives you wealth beyond your needs, beyond your means. Now look, if you're just meeting your means, well, praise God, all right? Praise God, that, you know, that's good, all right? But if you have more than you need, you know, instead of indulging, instead of making your face shine, you know, getting the, the facelifts and the, uh, what else, wax and fats, well, I guess, it's not really talking about getting fat, but I guess, you know, some rich people do get fat. I mean, what's that, Clive Palmer in Australia? I mean, that guy's huge. That guy's like a billionaire. He's like one of the richest men in Australia, right? He's wax and fat. He doesn't know what to do with the food. He just, he just eats, you know, just consumes it all, right? I mean, you know, people with too much money, they don't know what to do with it, so they self-indulge and they get into wicked behavior. Keep your finger there. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And again, this is why I believe God's not going to allow His children to be excessively rich. Excessively rich. Because God knows our hearts will follow off those things and all we're going to do is indulge ourselves. Okay? And we're going to forget the cause of the needy. We're not going to be looking out for the needs of others and see how we can help. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17. Now, if you are someone that is rich, if you are someone with wealth as a Christian, what should you do? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. The Bible says, charge them that are rich in this world. Okay? So again, Timothy is a pastor. Paul is telling Timothy, charge the rich. If you've got rich people in your church, teach them what to do. Okay? Charge them. It says, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Oh man, I'm such a good person. Look how rich I am. That's not how you should be. Right? No, don't be that way. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Still trust in the living God. Look at this. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So if you have wealth, if you have possessions, praise God. Give God thanks. God gave it to you. Okay? But don't have the attitude, oh, man, it's, oh, I'm so good. It's me. You know? I'm such a smart person. I'm such a smart investor. No, just give God the glory. Give God the thanks. He's given you those things, hey, to enjoy. Does, is, is God against you enjoying your wealth? No. All right? But let's keep going. To enjoy. Then verse number 18. That they do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. Okay? Hey, how can you be good? How, how can you do good if you're rich? Be ready to distribute. Start saying, all right, look, I've got too much. What is a good cause that I can give toward? Hey, my local church, that's a good place. All right? You're not giving to Pastor Kevin. You're giving to the house of God. You're giving to God's work. All right? Or you just find some other good works that are being done for God. Hey, I'm going to distribute here. I'm going to distribute there. Thank you, God, for giving me above and beyond so I can be a blessing to others. Amen. Learn to distribute, right? What else? Uh, to uh, Willing to communicate. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. He says, look, you got riches here? Well, you know what? You can translate those riches into eternal life if you use those riches to give glory to God, to serve God, to give to His work. Now you're laying upon a good foundation in heaven. When you get to, when you get to heaven, you're going to have great riches in heaven because you served God with the riches that you have on this earth. Okay, so God's not against rich people. Okay, just don't be prideful. Give God the thanks and find a work that you can contribute to that will further the kingdom of God. Okay? So God is not against riches. All right, let's keep going. Verse number 30. Jer uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse number 30. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. We're almost done now. So when it says wonderful, often when you think of wonderful, you think about something beautiful and amazing and great and fantastic. Wonderful comes from, of course, wonder. Like When you wonder, it's like, what, what is this saying is, it's unbelievable, okay? It's unbelievable. It, 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 you can't, you don't, it, it takes you by surprise. What's taking God by surprise? You know, what, what is it that's unbelievable? A wonderful, because then it says, and horrible thing. It's not a good thing. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. So we end this chapter with like the worst thing that's going on in this land. The worst thing. The most horrible thing that's going on in this land. You thought it was all the sin? It says here, the prophets prophesy falsely that's the worst thing that's the horrible that's it's unbelievable god's prophets the people that are supposed to be preaching god's word they're prophesying falsely do you understand why I'm, i want to be so careful in this church okay because these were god's people brethren you understand they have the teachings of god 
They know what God wants. They've gone generation after generation. Listen, the next generation, my children are important to me. Your children are important to me. I want them to love the Lord. I want them to serve the Lord. Don't forget our children. They're the future of this church. They're the future pastors. They're the future song leaders and the future, whatever, brethren. They're the future. They're the future, you know, uh, serving the, the, uh, the Lord. And, 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 and their generation is going to be even more wicked than the generation we grew up in. They're important. Our children, the next generation is important. Therefore, we need to teach our children the truth. We need to tell them, not just tell them what is right and wrong, but show them in God's word why it's right and wrong. Where does God say it's right and wrong? It says, and the priests bear, bear rule by their means. But look at this. And my people love to have it so. So even though the prophets are prophesying falsely, they're teaching lies, the people love it. They love it. Okay? <laughs> What will you do in the end thereof? What are you going to do at the end when you're destroyed? You know, but they love it. And brethren, listen, why aren't we a 10,000 member church? You know how easy, there are so many churches in Sydney that have literally thousands upon thousands of people in their churches. Is it because they're teaching the truth? It's because they love it. The world loves it. Why do they, what do they love? They love Preachers preaching false things, making them feel good about themselves. Uh, I guess we're not that bad after all. God's not going to judge Australia. You know, it's all fine. God's, all, God's never going to bring his rod of chastisement upon us. You know, God, in fact, they even deny hell. They don't even teach on hell anymore. I had a guy once call me. He claimed to be a Christian. And he says, how can you teach people about hell? That's not loving. It's like, what in the world? Of course we're going to teach people. We're going to teach them the truth. What do you want to do? Sugarcoat things? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Fables, stories, you know, fairy tales. A lot of preaching today, a lot of church today, it's just fairy tales. It's just wonderful stories. It scratches your ears. You know, do you like the story? You know, of Red Riding Hood? Did you like that story? Did you like the preaching today? You know, I told you about the, you know, go to locks and the, what is it? Go to locks and free the free bears. Did you like that preaching today, brethren? Did it make you feel good? Hey, that's what people love. People love that kind of fairy tale preaching. Let it not be so at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And let's make sure that we a seeking sound doctrine. Even if the fires of God's word burns us a little bit, at least you know your pastor loves you. The preacher loves you if they're trying to burn you a little bit, okay? Because they want to get rid, they want to consume the sin in your life so you can please God. So we would not be a people like the people of Judah were in this time of age, right? Where we can actually please God, where God can continue to at least, not, not necessarily bless our nation because of its weakness, but at least bless us. At least, you know, uh, we can please God. God can look down and God is looking for one man. I want God to say, man, all the men of Blessed Old Baptist Church are standing in the gap. All the men are serving me. That's what I want for this church. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord,